so I think because we have three hours and three hours of Linux I.O., uh, the stack of ac accepting information would be definitely full. Uh, we will make small stops like three to three to five minutes each hour or something like this. Uh, we actually have three logical blocks, but those blocks are so tightly interconnected that I cannot guarantee we uh, would not go round and round with uh, uh, approaching with uh, more details each time. So I think such pauses would be quite necessary. Um, my name is uh, Ilya. Uh, I'm working for Data Grid. Uh, and this tutorial, as you probably already know, would be about uh, Linux IO things for database administrators. Because uh, we are at the PostgreSQL conference, uh, I assume the primary interest is IO in terms of Postgres. So um, I will make a couple of notes about how it works in different databases, but mostly I will concentrate on the example of PostgreSQL. Uh, it doesn't actually matter because many things are common between databases, uh, but Postgres have some specifics like uh, heavy relies on uh, operating system mechanism on block IO, doesn't actually use uh, for production purposes, direct IO. So uh, some particular details about Postgres, uh, I think, would be important in this tutorial. So uh, did anyone attend uh, my tutorial last year, I believe, about general Linux tuning? So that's maybe good, because um, from one point of view, I will repeat some things th from that tutorial. Uh, but actually updated to the current situation. Uh, but this version is actually a different tutorial. Uh, we'll concentrate not on the general tuning of uh, Linux, but on um, IO specific things, which will allow us to speak a bit more about specific things like IO schedulers, uh, like uh, modern SSDs and how to work with them. Uh, so it's supposed to be more details and because of that, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. So if uh, you're interested in some detail or did not understand what I'm talking about or uh, have some question uh, related to your everyday life, uh, your everyday production with databases, just ask. Uh, if I plan to cover this uh, a few slides later, I will directly say, okay, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but if not, it's a good idea to uh, step a bit aside and talk about the things you really need to know uh, for your everyday work. Um, well, uh, let's begin, I think, everyone who, who wanted uh, already in the room. Uh, so um, I assume that most of you are database administrators. Uh, or, or just developers, architectures. Uh, what's the actually division? Who is DBA? Like DBA, DBA. A lot. Who is a Linux system administrator? Okay. And who is just software developer who comes to see if those DBAs will not kick him out? <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> that, that's I would say very good because, um, well, then DBA would be talking, ah, you consume all the 100% of my beloved database disk utilization. Um, you will understand why he, he told those crazy things. Anyway, it's, it's good to know how it works. So um, let's uh, begin. Yeah. Why this tutorial? Uh, currently, Linux is the most common operating system for databases. Uh, there is Windows, there is HP UX, there is uh, Solaris. Uh, two of them still exist. 
I'm actually surprised about that, but I think for a long time w they would be exist. But Linux actually now the most common operating system for databases. Uh, the performance uh, of Oracle on Linux is quite good. Oracle invests a lot into development of uh, Linux kernel. Uh, some databases actually support uh, only Linux uh, in the full scope of possibilities like MySQL actually uh, could be compiled on FreeBSD but about the performance nothing is guaranteed uh, as well as many different databases. Um, Postgres traditionally uh, supports lots of operating systems but well uh, we can guarantee that it tries to, to be compiled on many such systems. Uh, many performance things are actually uh, very tightly bound with Linux, with its internal mechanisms. And it's actually uh, a big problem for Postgres now because uh, many uh, postponed performance problems are here now because people say, okay, we cannot just write a separate code for Linux. We need to support BSD. We need to support this and that. Um, that's... Uh, actually impossible. Uh, so Linux in production, I would say that's close to 80% uh, at least. There are some legacy things which run on different database system. Uh, maybe because Postgres is not very good with uh, Windows because as a first step, uh, Windows do not have a shared memory in the Unix way. So lots of problems with performance we can see on Windows. Uh, for Postgres, it's actually a default uh, operating system. Uh, and DBAs uh, often run into problems. If you're working as an Oracle DBA, did anyone try it to work as an Oracle DBA? You probably can confront then that uh, Oracle DBA is mostly the database administrator. So basically, read this Oracle manual, do those things, uh, yes, it's complex, you need to think, but you do not need to um, dive deeply into the operating system things uh, except uh, this Linux tuning guide for the initial installation. Being a Postgres DBA, uh, you actually need to interact with operating system a lot, as well as if you are MySQL DBA, for example. Uh, because um, Oracle is some sort of operating system itself. Uh, it has uh, its own storage system, it has uh, this and that. Uh, Postgres relies on POSIX, relies on the common uh, Unix things, it uses F-Sync, it uses file system, it only works through file system, it doesn't have any things like bare metal uh, ISM uh, instance which allows to work with uh, Luns directly. So, DBA uh, who, work, who is working with Postgres should be a bit of a Linux administrator as well. But the problem is there are a lot of information on Linux kernel. The incredible source of uh, that information is LWN uh, network, uh, which contains a lot of articles, uh, what is going on in the kernel, how it works. Uh, I think uh, if someone wants uh, after the tutorial, you can drop me a message. Uh, my email would be on the last slide and on the first slide as well. And uh, I can drop you my slides and as well as a huge list of useful reading uh, from LWN as well uh, on the topic related to uh, material of today's tutorial. So um, I can point you out which article is useful to read if you want because uh, they are complex and the most problem is they are written uh, by kernel developers for kernel developers. So for DBA it actually a lot of excessive work to dig through them. So that's why I tried to summarize that in some useful pictures <laughs> and we go through them. Uh, and actually one of my goals is not to explain you everything about Linux or your uh, in context of databases. Uh, that's simply impossible in three hours. But uh, give you a clue uh, where to uh, dig if you have a problem and uh, what to, to watch, uh, which resources, uh, if you want to be 
um, just uh, aware of what is going on in Linux development now and uh, what you need to read uh, to keep yourself updated. Uh, another problem is that uh, since last four or five years, actually Linux IO stack is uh, under massive, massive overhaul. Uh, for a lot of, I think, at least ten years before that, the IO stack was like frozen. It was uh, designed for old rotating disks. Uh, many things were, were done uh, for disks which are uh, now you can find them in the museum, not, uh, or, or, well, in some data centers you can find them. <laughs> uh, but uh, even during one year uh, or during several months, uh, the progress of uh, IOS Tech of Linux is uh, dramatical. So I try to summarize that, to systemize that, and give you a clue where to, to check what is going on uh, if, for example, you will run into a problem in half a year or next year or something like this. So bird eye view, uh, our agenda, uh, how generic database or Postgres specifically interacts with IO, uh, and some things, how Linux works with memory, how Linux works with disks. And those two things are actually very tightly interconnected because the whole st stake is, uh, stack is involved. Um, we cannot only tune some disk parameters and uh, achieve the best I.O. We need to tune memory and disks uh, together. So that's why those things. Well, a typical database, uh, you probably can guess uh, based off uh, some things that this is Postgres, but it doesn't matter at this point. Uh, looks like this. You have memory you have disk subsystem, and uh, you have some memory structures which are typical for a database. Uh, most of the database uh, use uh, this and that analog of uh, shared buffers in Postgres. Let's call that shared memory. Uh, so if, especially if we're working on Linux and database uh, relies on processes, it should use um, shared memory to interact and the significant amount of this memory would be actually a uh, page cache. Uh, the cache of uh, the small blocks, which um, are just the image in the memory of those blocks on the disk. Uh, in Postgres, we call them pages. Uh, most likely, they are 8 kilobits uh, in size. Theoretically, you can recompile Postgres with another block size, but for Postgres it's not that important. Uh, I know many Oracle people for analytics in, tend to use different block sizes. For Postgres I would not say that's uh, the default practice. Uh, so why uh, pages are so important, why uh, they were chosen actually? Uh, the idea is very simple because uh, on those small pieces of information it's quite easy to build all the mathematics about the transaction scheduling. So uh, all these algorithms of uh, locking of MVCC, they are specially designed and they work quite well on the page model. So uh, this idea is very common in database world uh, and in spite we have um, object databases, network databases, search structures and so on, most of the databases which are uh, designed for working with OLTP, uh, with fast transaction processing, they uh, use this page model. And the idea is uh, quite easy. Uh, then we have a page in the shared memory, then we modify this page, we call it the dirty page. And if we modify anything in this page, one tuple, one row, uh, the page is already dirty. This is a simplification, but for our purposes, uh, that's quite enough for today. Uh, if we change something in a page, we write right ahead log through the uh, wall buffer. Uh, and this is a mechanism how to make recovery effective uh, if we just, at some point, uh, lose the electricity and uh, 
our database machine goes down, uh, we lose all the data in memory. And to recover, we need to replay this write ahead log um, and make those things consistent again. Uh, so uh, that's uh, how typical database looks like. And uh, next hour, at least, we'll dig into details how this works. Uh, if uh, you take a look on this small line, I actually uh, divided the user space and the kernel space because if we use a block I/O, we uh, have so-called page cache in the kernel and we have shared memory, shared buffers uh, of PostgreSQL in user space. So PostgreSQL actually is a user space program. So um, it uses uh, the memory structure in the user space and it operates from the user space with those things. And um, as a main mechanism of getting the pages from the disk uh, into the shared memory and back is to go through the page cache of the kernel. So it's, it's sort of, uh, well, double caching in this case. Because to get the page, we need first put that to the page cache and then to the shared memory. We cannot access from user space uh, directly with SQL command or something like this to uh, kernel buffer uh, we need to put that to shared memory first, and then we can access that uh, like, like we uh, used to. Uh, not every database now uses this model, but Postgres still uses this uh, buffer tile. Uh, all the schema is quite uh, easy if we need just to read. Uh, there are some small problems with that as well, but Generally, uh, well, we have some query. We connect to exact PostgreSQL process, the worker. It has its process memory, uh, which we call workmem. There are different types of workmem. You're probably aware of that. Uh, we will not focus on that uh, deeply. Uh, and in this memory, uh, Postgres compiles your uh, SQL in some way. Um, perform some rewriting, op optimization, and things like that, then it asks for a uh, relevant page from shared buffers. And if this page is already in shared buffers, that's okay. We just return this uh, to the client which asks that from the worker. If not, we ask the page cache if page cache has this page. Uh, and if it has at this point, we copy these to shared buffers and then return to the client. Or if not, we perform the proper read. So we get that from the disk, put in the page cache, put into shared buffers. Well, quite ineffective, but that's how it works. That allows Postgres to run on many platforms and uh, if the platform supported sync in traditional way, that's a good idea. That was the initial idea of this architecture. Uh, for many databases, uh, that was uh, the initial idea. Then uh, the question of performance uh, became a big problem. Many databases moved to so-called direct IO. That means going to the disk directly from uh, the database. For the kernel, uh, using the special flag uh, or direct, but uh, that's supposed to be more efficient. Uh, for Postgres, uh, we will talk about our direct uh, just in the end of this tutorial uh, to uh, figure out uh, what is the state of the art or direct and Postgres and what is going on, how we can benefit and how we couldn't. But the big problem is if we want not just to read the data, but if we want to uh, write the data. Because if we change something, uh, this shared memory uh, is just not the copy of this disk. Those two things are inconsistent. So we change something in shared buffers, and uh, the relevant page on the disk is different because uh, we just read that, changed that, 
and it is still in memory. Uh, to make this uh, more efficient, uh, the algorithm of uh, right ahead log or RES, uh, like a computer scientists will call that, uh, was designed. And the basic idea is then we change something if we have update query. Uh, we do not return from the transaction. Like we say commit and we wait for some time, then commit returns. We never return until we put the information which we need for recovery to write ahead log. And from the perspective of uh, IO, that works like uh, we have a wall buffer. Uh, we put this information to the wall buffer. This wall buffer f syncs to the wall. We have file with this necessary information, uh, which allows us to replay log and to recover the initial uh, state of the page or the new one. It depends of the outcome of transaction. Um, and uh, after we successfully written the wall, we can return from our operation. So uh, the difference is we have still inconsistent uh, disk <coughs> image, uh, inconsistent to the shared buffers, but uh, we have all the information uh, in case of emergency if uh, those things go down, uh, our memory uh, is a volatile one, so that it just goes down without any um, things uh, reside in the memory, uh, and we need to recover in that case. Uh, from time to time, uh, we need to sync those uh, pages to disk, because otherwise the problem would be uh, we write data, write data for several days, several months, several years. We have tremendous amount of uh, uh, writes, and that's why we have lots of write-ahead log, and uh, we have lots of inconsistency between disk and memory, so the recovery would be very inefficient in this case. So uh, what we do, from time to time, we perform so-called checkpoint. So at some point of time we say, okay, let's get all those dirty uh, pages, put them to disk, and put the mark and write ahead log that up until to this moment, they are consistent. And then the inconsistency starts to grow up, then we uh, write uh, new transactions to the log. Um, so mm, uh, the main problem for the databases is actually uh, to maximize page throughput between uh, memory and disk. So we have those uh, pages, dirty and clean, and we need to get them back uh, <coughs> to disks and to the memory uh, in a very efficient manner. Uh, that was the main problem for a while, um, because uh, this part of the stack, disks, it was very slow. It was rotating disk which uh, need to seek. They need to move the magnetic head. And comparing to these interactions, uh, moving the magnetic disk is very, very slow. So um, <laughs> latency was not that important for us. But we need to design our system to improve the throughput, how many dirty pages we can get back and forth. Uh, just uh, to mention, uh, not only uh, disk uh, cause I.O. problems uh, in databases. Uh, we can imagine, for example, uh, the system with very good disks, with a lot of memory, but the single CPU. Most likely, in this case, uh, a uh, piece of software like PostgreSQL, which relies on different processes, uh, would not perform in terms of I.O. quite good, because we need lots of CPUs uh, to handle our processes. Otherwise, uh, they all would be waiting for uh, a single CPU, and I.O. would be, well, uh, not very good. 
Uh, everyone can try to uh, emulate this using VMware on the laptop uh, with single processor emulation, and that would be quite bad. Another problem with I.O. is actually the network I.O., but it's a bit outside of our today's topic. Uh, that, that's also input-output, but we will concentrate on memory and disks. Uh, as you see, uh, pretty much everything in uh, the computer and the server involved in uh, this page, efficient page travel. Uh, you need enough memory to accommodate a lot of um, your hot data, which you uh, constantly read and write. Otherwise, uh, the read I.O. at least would increase drastically because you constantly will need to uh, free some space in your shared buffers, uh, drop one set of pages to the disk, then read another one. Now, that increases uh, I.O. quite a bit. Uh, you need lots of CPUs because if you have process model, uh, you need lots of CPUs to work with these uh, I.O. operations. Well, you need a lot of CPU. Uh, you, know, some, uh, you need some mechanism of I.O. scheduling because uh, if this stack is not very efficient, uh, you need to, uh, to try to uh, mo make all the requests, uh, I don't know, if, if they comes from this uh, spindle, you need to put them together to put on this disk. If they are on this sector or on this sector, you need to... Um, read them smartly to minimize uh, seek uh, and so on. So you need some subsystem to, uh, to make intellectual I.O. Uh, which we call traditionally I.O. scheduler and which became not very intellectual actually if uh, we talk about modern uh, SSDs, not the spindles. Um, we need file system and we need to tune database itself to work with this stack quite officially. Uh, well, um, if we take a look on this stack, it's obvious that uh, there are no negative figures uh, with getting from one step to another one. Uh, if we um, put the data to, uh, from one buffer to another one, from user space to kernel space, it, uh, all, th all those operations cost uh, time and resources. So mm, uh, even if we try to maximize throughput, uh, there is a problem of latency in this case. So um, up to some point, uh, it's quite easy to uh, maximize overall I.O. performance with um, maximizing throughput, like Postgres did actually for years. Uh, we have checkpointer, checkpointer, performs not very good. We have background writer, which tries to help Postgres in some cases to uh, dump uh, some pages to the disk. Uh, both of them can perform slightly better up to a certain moment. Then we need to uh, improve uh, the things uh, even more. Uh, so at some point, uh, we need to minimize uh, latency for many of those operations. And uh, that actually already happened with uh, introduction of SSDs. So we had so many latency at the point of the uh, disk of the hardware. Uh, so then we uh, get uh, proper SSDs, uh, the things became uh, quite good. That good that actually uh, nor Postgres, neither Linux were well prepared for that. Uh, so uh, many things should be redesigned now. Uh, the, the common uh, example of uh, difference between throughput and latency is just imagine we need to transport uh, our cells from point A to point B, like from University of Ottawa to Ottawa Airport. Uh, and well, if we have uh, a normal car which can travel with average speed of 50 kilometers per hour, uh, it's a sufficient transport for that purpose. Uh, up to a certain point, that's well enough for us. We can build uh, a highway with many lines, and many people will be go from one point to another point. Uh, if we run into problems that 
not all the people can travel, like those dirty pages too. You know, we can build another line, or we can build the specific line for express bus and put many people in this bus. This is the typical example of uh, how we maximize uh, throughput instead of uh, decrease in latency, actually, because up to a certain point we can uh, build this infrastructure quite uh, inexpensive and it works for us. But at some point we definitely will run into the problem that the single page even on the empty road cannot travel uh, faster than average speed of 50 kilometers per hour or maybe 80 but that's not a big uh, deal for us in that case and then we need to build for example uh, uh, express railroad which is much more expensive and uh, put the fast train on that which is a, a typical uh, a quite different story in this case um, so that's the difference between latency and throughput and actually in terms of database performance we need to utilize both approaches and uh, up to certain moment uh, the databases and uh, Linux uh, actually were all about the, how to live with the slow disks uh, now we have modern SSDs and now the another problem is that all this uh, op optimized for years stack of technology should be modernized to work with modern situation. Key things about uh, modern database workload. Uh, shared memory segment can be very large. So um, then those algorithms with pages, locking, blocking, and so on, were initially designed. Uh, the eight megabytes was a huge amount of RAM. Now actually a terabyte of RAM is it's not a big deal anymore. Uh, I believe for database server 256 is, is a default now maybe. Uh, but even 32 gigs it's a it's significant amount for those approaches. Uh, then you keep those pages synchronized you can generate a lot of I.O. Uh, wall should be written quite safe and good. So even if you try put it into the memory disk and something like this, that's not a proper solution because it should be written safe and good. So um, some Postgres installations of our customers then can generate tons of write ahead log uh, per hour. And well, uh, we need to tune this and this so um, it's impossible now to say, well, guys, uh, the computers are slow, uh, DBAs are expensive. Uh, we just stop to generate those uh, stupid amount of data. Uh, people really want to, to have big data. So there is no way we need to accommodate. Uh, and mm, the another part is you cannot just uh, step by step tune something like uh, we make the memory a bit efficient. We, after that next step, we need to make the disk more efficient. That doesn't work. Uh, you need to tune all the stack and <coughs> change hardware and immediately go through the stack and improve the things. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, shared buffers are more or less relevant than before with SSDs. Uh, well, they they are still quite faster. <laughs> So uh, um, I, I would say that persistent memory is not uh, the current state of art. So uh, persistent memory is the thing which come uh, and its future. And uh, the first problem is that maybe persistent memory, which is supposed to be as fast as normal memory, it will come in one or two years and or three years or something like this. Uh, but how much time it would take for Postgres and Linux to uh, adopt to the usage of this memory, I would not say that uh, uh, that's a close future. So um, the size of shard buffers is still very relevant. It's still much faster to access shard buffers. So in Postgres, we have uh, some specific uh, workload, which is very typical for Postgres. Uh, checkpoint and other synchronization mechanism, which we'll cover in much more 
uh, detailed approach. Um, in Oracle, if we compare log writer, DB writer, uh, they uh, use a synchronous I.O. nowadays. So basically, it looks like we have a dedicated process which works with task of write and write ahead log, for example, and it swaps several threads uh, which write data independently, and that's very efficient. Uh, in Postgres, we have a straightforward process which actually issues F-Sync, and um, this is not that efficient in terms of I.O. So if we need to put a lot of data through our I.O. stack, uh, we need to do something with that. It's a challenge in Postgres. In Postgres, we have a very unique tradition of auto ICO, uh, which, um, well, basically it's uh, the uh, design mistake uh, which becomes a feature. And for the last 20 years, we uh, make a lot of work around how to live with that. M most likely, if you take a look on the process of development Postgres, um, those pluggable storage things, Zheap, and so on, uh, most of developers realize that this is actually a bug, out of vacuum. That's not a feature. We need to get rid of that, but it's very difficult. Uh, for the next, I, uh, I think, five to six years, we need to live with AutoVacuum. AutoVacuum can, uh, first of all, uh, generate s some amount of I.O. by itself, but the most problem, if AutoVacuum works not correctly, your data would be blo bloated. And if your data is bloated, that means much more I.O. than necessary, and you need to make a lot of optimization in this case. So AutoVacuum is another I.O. challenge for Postgres. Cache refill, obviously, because Postgres put everything to um, kernel buffer, then put that uh, to the shared buffers, then uh, you restart uh, your database. Uh, you need actually uh, to refill the cache uh, to get the normal uh, performance profile. There are some things like uh, preworm and so on, but most of them work correctly only if you shut down your database correctly not if it was crushed and recovered and things like that. So uh, anyway, um, you probably can think that we can use a lot of memory, put all the data in this memory and use cheap uh, set of disks, but that doesn't work because in this case you will uh, restart your database for several days uh, with lots of problems for the final customer. So um, everything should be balanced and that's and another challenge. Besides of these, uh, Postgres use uh, lots of uh, auxiliary um, I/O operations in the workers that workers which work with uh, clients queries. So um, then uh, the query contains things like uh, sort, hash, things like that, and it doesn't fit into the work memory. Worker swaps to the disk. And this is bad because it, it's not designed for that. It's pretty much very inefficient. Uh, everyone can check that uh, if uh, you see in explain analyze that your sort is on the disk, it would be very slow. If you increase work mem, you will see that now it's in memory and it works much faster. So um, this uh, activity uh, with disk from the workers can be uh, um, very challenging for DBAs. Besides of this, if a um, background worker and checkpointer cannot uh, cope with a lot amount of data they need to have seen during the checkpoints, uh, in these cases, workers can actually synchronize the data with disk on their own. We will take uh, a look on this mechanism a few slides later, but it can be a huge problem because for that purpose, workers definitely not designed. And this is actually some case of emergency in this case. So uh, those are challenges for Postgres. So uh, what is checkpoint uh, and how it works? Uh, checkpoint actually issues uh, based on your configuration 
by timeout or by the amount of write ahead log. Uh, which one is better? It's an arguable question, and we will argue about that. <laughs> uh, and mm, the idea is just to uh, issue fsync for all open files. So that means that actually all the dirty pages will be synchronized with disk, and then it's successfully performed. Uh, Checkpointer put the special uh, type of record to write ahead log that uh, before this checkpoint, everything is synchronized. Theoretically, it's quite easy. Uh, we just issue a checkpoint. You can do that from the command line, but uh, it, it's only necessary if you want, for example, uh, stop your Postgres without huge timeout, for example, if you pulse PG Bouncer and want to restart. Um, but normally it's uh, performed by the dedicated worker, checkpointer, and, well, um, theoretically no problem with that. But uh, if you take a look on the monitoring, uh, then you have problems with checkpointer. You will see that probably after checkpointer fires, uh, your disk utilization can be 99% uh, or 100% for a significant amount of time. That means your I/O system is actually overwhelmed with uh, those F-Syncs uh, and you need to tune something to make the things better. Actually, uh, not only the checkpointer can issue page synchronization. Uh, the normal procedure is, from time to time, uh, you have F-Sync, which actually synchronizes some of your pages, and at some point it, it is successful and, well, everything is okay. But if it cannot manage that, uh, there is uh, an auxiliary process uh, we call background writer, uh, which is based on its name. Uh, in the background between checkpoints helps to uh, put uh, some dirty pages to the disk if they are not uh, necessary now, if they are deep in the cache. So I can uh, explain that in a bit of more details, like, uh, is it okay for everyone uh, to take a look on this one? Uh, I will change the, the boards to... Uh, we have a timeline. Uh, and imagine at this point, checkpoint happens. And this is disk utilization, like IU utilization. And it looks normally like this. It increased and then in some form it goes down. And the quite normal situation if it looks like this. So before the next checkpoint, this checkpoint is over. The problem starts then you have that crazy amount of uh, writes that it starts, it doesn't end, and then another one comes, and it's, it looks like this. Even more and more up until it hits the 100%. Uh, in this case, the good idea is, uh, during this period of time, uh, to, to get some pages which are not necessary in use now, because they're deep in the cache, and put them to the disk. So, at this point, as usual, checkpoint starts, it goes to the next one, it's supposed to be not not a correct one, it, it should run into the another one. But from time to time, the ground worker starts to sync the pages, the small amount of them, and it reduces the amount of pages the checkpointer should actually put down. And because of that, it can finish on time. So uh, that's basically a mechanism of uh, the ground writer. Uh, but the problem is uh, you can barely control that <laughs> because it's an old piece of software and, uh, well, it has lots of uh, uh, design problems and it's difficult to rework them. Uh, well, 
at least it should be not a single threaded process. Uh, it should have better diagnostics and so on. Uh, and it should work more efficiently because now it actually can take only a few pages actually comparing to the size of shared buffer. But we will talk about that a bit more. Another way of thinking is things issued by an ordinary worker. Uh, what is this and uh, why it's a problem? Uh, just imagine uh, you have the bad checkpoint which run into an hour one and your uh, uh, input output system utilized. Uh, another client fires a query which uh, contains, I don't know, select something from something. Uh, theoretically, what should happen in this case? Uh, in this case, uh, we need to go to shared buffers, take a look if we do not have necessary data. Uh, in worst case, we do not have. We need to read this data from disk and put to the shared buffers. But our shared buffers are fully dirty. So we cannot put some pages to the disk safely. We need to wait up until the checkpoint successfully finish. But we can't because it is working. And what else can we do? Then um, the worker tries to figure out if there are some dirty pages which the worker can, on its own, f sync to the disk. And it does so. Then just imagine, you maybe try to issue checkpoint from the console that takes some time. If a worker goes from, uh, through the shared buffers, tries to figure out if we need to put those dirty pages to the disk, uh, then it tries to f-sync those through the file system, which barely 100% utilized. It's a significant timeout. And this timeout, actually, is a timeout for the end user, because uh, he just runs query, or application runs query. The application or end user, they do not care about the f-sync in these under the hood things. But they need to wait this time. So it's definitely a state of emergency. So if uh, your uh, workers are uh, issuing FC too frequently, or if they do that at, at all, uh, that means actually your clients are waiting for each query. That's bad. That's definitely bad, and that's a bad way to issue that. Uh, checkpoints. So basically, you need to tune your Postgres in that way that uh, as much as possible of work uh, is done by background writer. The most of work is actually done by checkpointer, but well, uh, if your background writer make a lot of things, uh, then checkpointer works more efficient. Uh, and never ever have sync with uh, worker. So what does Checkpointer short summary? It flushes all the dirty pages, basically by calling fsync for open files, and add Checkpoint record to the wall. Uh, in Postgres, you can tune Checkpointer to be more efficient. Uh, well, first thing is uh, the parameter we call uh, wall buffers. Uh, in some tutorials on uh, write performance tuning for Postgres, you can find uh, suggestions to put that to the 16 megabytes um, automatically, and that's it. But modern default is minus one, and I would say that's quite enough. I never run into issues with uh, bad behavior of this parameter for, for years. Uh, minus one means automatic. Uh, automatic means that uh, wall buffer is a fraction around of 3% of the size of shared buffers, but no more than the size of the single right head lock. So um, basically, um, it's designed to flush the right head lock in huge chunks, because if you do that more frequently, uh, you have some penalty for 
context switch, for logs, and so on. So basically, if you have lots of writes, it's quite safe to have this a bit bigger, and automatics in Postgres do that well for you. So it, it grows to the normal size, uh, and you're on the safe side. Just leave this parameter as is. Uh, then uh, the basic idea is to, uh, to write more data than your file system and your storage can afford those writes. Uh, and for those idea, you can actually uh, set up uh, checkpoint triggering by two uh, parameters, uh, which one comes first. On the next slide, uh, I have some sort of uh, analogy how, how it can work. Just imagine that uh, we have a bottle, a funnel, some bucket which uh, collects water from the pipe, and from time to time, uh, it can uh, pull this water to the funnel and to the bottle. Actually, the bottle is our storage. The funnel is the thing like uh, cache on the control, uh, cache on the SSD with uh, enabled uh, cache, with built-in cache. So um, this is actually a bottleneck, and this is the capacity of our cache. So we can theoretically fool the, the funnel full, and uh, it can accommodate all the data uh, while we uh, wait for the next checkpoint. So it's on us to decide what we want. We can drop uh, the water here by the small portions, and it will go to the bottle fast. Uh, but that's maybe not the efficient way if we can fool the funnel and uh, then wait for the next amount of water. So it's our decision what we can choose. Uh, if we use uh, max wall size, it's basically the idea of using the full funnel. So uh, we have some amount of cache on conventional rate controller, or we have some cache on the modern SSD. Uh, so basically, depends on the size of this cache, we say, uh, okay, I want max wall size of uh, one gigabyte. Uh, and the checkpoint would be occurring once uh, of this time. We have one gigabyte of right ahead log, we issue checkpoint, we supposed to be aware that our disk can accommodate this. And actually, if we have PCIe a modern SSD from Intel with a uh, supercapacitor to uh, make uh, this uh, cache safe for us. Uh, well, we can write a lot in this case. And in this case, actually, uh, it's a good idea to uh, set the checkpoint timeout reasonably high, like one hour, and relay on uh, max wall size. Uh, so, then we get a lot of right ahead log, we just drop it. Uh, another approach is actually to checkpoint by timeout. Uh, the main case for this is if you want to uh, minimize the recovery time. Because if you have uh, checkpoints uh, every minute, that means uh, your data is well synchronized. So if there is a failure, you can recover fast. Uh, but well, if you have OLTP system with a lot of writes, most likely that means uh, you have some high availability solution. So uh, in this case, uh, recovery from the backup uh, is very rare thing. Uh, you actually will uh, make the recover from the backup maybe only if your replica goes down, if uh, uh, atomic bomb explodes or something like this. Most likely you will immediately switch to uh, the replica and only if some, something goes wrong you will uh, go and uh, use your backup. So uh, from my point of view, uh, for modern databases, uh, for, for, well, for modern workloads, uh, 
and Postgres, uh, better idea uh, to use less frequent um, checkpoints by the amount of wall uh, with um, some reasonably high timeout, like one hour or something like this. Uh, the reason for that, why it maximizes performance, is uh, you have fast disks, and those disks can actually uh, write a lot of data. So let's write them in large portions, uh, but this portion can go to the disk and not overwhelm uh, the input-output system. So, well, why not? Why not to do that? Um, the last parameter which is uh, important for us in this case is checkpoint completion target. Uh, which actually regulates uh, the intensity of these spikes. Like if uh, we uh, say uh, 0.1, which means 10%, because that's uh, from, 10 per, uh, from 0 to uh, 100%, um, checkpointer would try to, to make checkpoint very intensively. And to finish this in... 10% of time. If instead of this we put 0, 7, 0, 9, it tries to do the checkpoint less intensively and finishes this in 90% of time, for example. That works with checkpoint by timeout based on the time. That works with uh, checkpoint by the amount of uh, wall based on the amount of wall uh, during last checkpoints. So that mechanism works quite well. And honestly, I did not saw the cases. Uh, then you need actually a checkpoint completion target like 0 0.1. Uh, official excuse for having this parameter uh, not by default like 0 0.9, is uh, very typical for Postgres, like uh, what if we need to install Postgres on the OpenBSD in the coffee machine? Of course, then we'll have uh, a very weak uh, disk system, and then we need to not uh, kill this uh, disk system by these crazy settings, which can actually uh, utilize that... Uh, 200, 1,000% or something like this, if it's possible. So, uh, the, this is the first hour, so I think we make the three minutes break just not to be overwhelmed like that checkpoint. Uh, and then we proceed with checkpoints further. So we start and one or two minutes past two. Oh. Yeah. Okay. They can. The session can do. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. And that, that that's the best thing. <laughs> it's the best thing. <laughs> In fact, also checkpoint should should. Yeah, they, they, they do that, uh, but, but if they cannot perform uh, well uh, and you need free buffers, then the worker actually... Yeah, but they, they make problem worse. Yes, exactly. <laughs> In fact, background writer should be the only one managing yes. the cache, and the other ones can try to trigger him, but... Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a very ancient piece of software, and it, it needs to be reworked. Uh -huh. mm. But then also, the, the, the checkpoint was responsible for the, the, the rights, but also keeping track of what has been done. That's, uh, it, it will always be late by updating what he did. Well, actually, mm, it has some statistics which he writes uh, uh, to the pages that... Yeah. Did you write her? I will talk about this view and what does it mean. So, yeah. but well, yes, <laughs> it, it, it's a problem. <laughs> if he doesn't finish in time, he hasn't updated what he did and has to do it again next time. Or no, 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 no. Actually, uh, how it works? Uh, you have several open files, mm -hmm. and checkpointer just issues the f-syncs, mm -hmm. 
and um, if the F sync finished, he knows that everything's okay. Yeah. So uh, basically, uh, if he doesn't win, uh, fi finish up to certain point, and then now a checkpoint hit it, uh, it already knows that this and that. Uh, yeah, yeah, beca because the, this open file is already synced and nothing to do there. Yeah, per file, but not, the, you know, not for, for pages. Not for pages, yeah. Per file. He, he works on my file? Yeah. So he has to scan the scan buffers each time, yeah. collect them per yeah. file? Yeah. Okay. It's pretty inefficient. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> is this a, a coffee? Uh, uh, in the other room we have coffee. Uh, in the other room, but uh, I don't remember which time it is supposed to be. <laughs> Hello. Sorry. Uh, I, I, I have to run, but I was wondering, like, I would still like to know about it and, like, maybe have some reference material. Um, just uh, drop me an email and uh, to go with everyone else in two or three days, I will send the material and the uh, written list. Okay. Uh, where can I get your email? Yeah. No problems, actually. We all have things to do. Yeah, man, it's, it's like... Yeah, okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Take care. You too. So should we proceed? Slowly. <laughs> okay. So it was first part, and now we proceed with another ways how Postgres can write. Um, another thing is background writer which we already partially touched, and now we go forward. So um, the idea is we have uh, last recently used algorithm in uh, shared buffers. So basically, if uh, we do not need the page, it syncs through uh, the cache. Uh, it actually uses uh, the pretty straightforward clock swipe algorithm, uh, which is not very efficient and there is work in progress for using Radix tree for that. And it's supposed to be more efficient in future versions of Postgres, I think. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can find uh, Andreas Freund 
uh, who actually uh, makes a lot of work in this direction and socially kick him uh, during the beer session to, uh, to make uh, the changes faster <laughs> uh, to improve things. But um, the basic idea uh, which is important for us now is that if the page syncs, it can be actually, uh, without any specific thing like checkpoint, it can be put it on disk. So um, the idea of background writer is to scan the shared buffers up to a certain moment because it can be actually pretty much very slow to scan all the shared buffers, especially if we have heavy workload. Uh, at least that idea was behind on this design initially. Uh, so it scans some amount of buffers, uh, and then if they are no longer needed, it puts them to the disk. So in this way, uh, background writer actually helps checkpointer to reduce amount of dirty pages uh, it needs to f-sync uh, during the main checkpoint. Uh, initially it designed to help checkpointer, but well, initially it was the single process which was split, uh, but that historical detail is not that important for us. Uh, but it has lots of uh, design problems. Uh, the first of uh, those problems from my point of view is that it's actually not parallel. So um, background writer is a very independent thing. You can actually go through the shared buffers, take a look if the page is uh, no longer in use and put that page to the disk. And you can do that uh, like 10 processes simultaneously. That's not a big problem. But uh, for a long time there was more, uh, the, there were more important tasks for Postgres code developers uh, and nobody just looked to that background writer. Um, so it's, it's a good candidate to be reworked, but well, I have no idea when it can happen. Right now there was there are several improvements of uh, BG writer behavior and there are several configuration parameters we actually can uh, use uh, to work with it. Uh, we have a background writer delay because it delays for certain amount of uh, milliseconds, I believe. Uh, then uh, BG writer uh, has an estimation uh, how many pages uh, we needed last time uh, to, to free to uh, read the uh, new data uh, for the user qu queries. So basically it has estimation that, uh, okay, normally we need free 2,000 pages uh, like uh, to read uh, new data in the next several minutes or something like this. Uh, it multiplies that estimation amount by uh, this multiplier uh, and goes through the shared buffers, try to find that amount of pages, but no more than this. So basically its maximum is pretty much straightforward, it's 1000 or something like this. That makes it actually pretty inefficient. Uh, and um, normal approach was like, well, let's do like this. Uh, let's maximize this one, maximize this one, and maximize the delay uh, to make sure that uh, between delays it, uh, it consumes maximum amount of pages and put that to the disks. For, uh, before 9.5, uh, it was the general approach and uh, it was, I was actually very curious every time why not to make this a default uh, thing, but the argument was the same. If we need to put Postgres on the coffee machine which runs OpenBSD, we need not to overwhelm its disk subsystem if it has a disk. So we have defaults which are quite mild. So uh, that's how it works. Uh, after 9.5, there were some uh, slight improvements in um, uh, l last recently used algorithm. And actually, Postgres now pre-sort uh, those pages which are no longer needed, so uh, they are now accessible for background writers. So uh, you can still set those parameters like this uh, if it helps, but well, uh, 
it doesn't matter, matter actually quite much. Uh, and uh, background writer will go to those pages which are not needed and put them back to disk. Um, it's not very drastical solution, but well, it works. Uh, it actually helps uh, Checkpointer to reduce amount of pages it needs to sync. So I actually recommend to use maximum values for uh, for this and just forgot about this and why wait uh, until it would be reworked uh, by the developers. Uh, the simple worker uh, can actually issue a sync as well. And the case for this uh, is then there is no uh, more uh, free buffers left uh, to read the data. And this is bad case and you need to try to avoid that and I would suggest that actually even it's a good idea to put these statistics on the monitoring. Uh, we'll talk when, uh, where, where we can get these statistics. Uh, and, well, uh, it's worst day to sync because the worker is not designed for this. And uh, every such sync, it's a significant timeout, significant delay for the end user. Um, just in case, um, how to, uh, yes? Uh, will these show, show up as um, requested checkpoints rather than prime checkpoints in the catalog? Uh, well, uh, there is a view called uh, pgstatb generator, uh, which you are talking about, uh, which has confusing name because it's actually a pgstat checkpointer. But historically, that was the same process, uh, which was split later and the view remained pgstatbg writer. Uh, well, uh, because we had pgxlog for a long time instead of wall. Um, there are several parameters, checkpoint timed, uh, checkpoint requested. Uh, those are about uh, how, how many checkpoints happened uh, by wall size, how many happened by uh, timeout. Uh, this particular thing uh, in this view is actually um, uh, backend sync, backend of sync. And it's supposed to be zero, actually. If it's not zero, check what is going on, why it's not zero. And um, my suggestion is actually uh, uh, the problem with this single uh, row view is uh, that you you need to uh, reset statistics for this view to make it useful. There is a uh, pg reset, uh, reset stats shared, uh, which is designed to be uh, uh, to reset uh, pg writer statistics. And it accepts the single argument pg writer and then resets the specific statistics uh, separately from all the different statistics. Uh, and my suggestion is actually to reset that every day at midnight and put those figures to the graphic and to see what's going on. Uh, that's make actually very useful estimation what's going on in your system. For some cases, then, for example, you're troubleshooting this performance uh, for prime time workload or something like this. Uh, maybe it's a good idea to make this one per hour, but in normal situation I would suggest one, once a day and put that to the graphic. So it's a general approach how to, how to do that. Um, well, well, actually we need uh, some refactoring on this view because uh, it's pretty unobvious. Uh, you, every time you need to go to the documentation to uh, recall uh, which string, what does it mean? Because uh, backend of sync that doesn't suggest that <laughs> It's bad of things with uh, uh, performed by Walker. So another huge topic which we need to cover, but we don't move from the previous one. We will uh, talk about this one in scope of uh, Postgres and database workload. How Linux works with memory, because it's important part of the I/O. Uh, we put something from the memory and put to the disk. The first uh, important topic in terms of how to work with Linux is NUMA, or non-uniform memory access, which most likely your case because 
Uh, honestly, I did not saw any uh, modern server which we normally utilize for databases without new architecture. Uh, the basic idea is the CPU has its own memory and um, those memory connected with NUMA interconnect, which is supposed to be much faster than uh, memory bus. And CPU uses its own memory because it's close by to the CPU, it's easy to access, uh, it's faster, and so on. Um, and if the CPU needs more memory, it actually can access through the interconnect another piece of memory from different CPU. Uh, and theoretically, it's very good. But practically, uh, your operating system needs to support this, Linux does, and your user space application is supposed to support those things. And in case of Postgres, that's not true. <laughs> and uh, this is a problem. So what is NUMA? Basically, you have interconnect, you have local memory, you have those CPU blocks. That's uh, oversimplified things uh, which are uh, not real because uh, even in simple uh, Intels nowadays, uh, those things are much more complicated uh, with uh, different schemas of interconnect and so on. Uh, if someone in interests, uh, you can take a look. But for us, it's important that um, if this CPU works with this piece of memory uh, and it needs more, it needs to go through the interconnect, which is actually, in most cases, slower than just randomly access memory from any CPU. So this uh, NUMA thing became a bottleneck if uh, we start Postgres with, uh, say, uh, 64 gigabits of shared buffers, and all those 64 megabits go through one of the CPUs, through interconnect to other CPUs. So the single process starts to work with one numazon and uh, through one numazon, and that's uh, very bad because uh, what you practically see, uh, all your processes uh, suddenly stuck. Uh, one of them is like 100% CPU utilization, and that lasts for uh, several seconds to many seconds, and then everything changes and everything works. And then you try to investigate this case, uh, you cannot get what's wrong actually, because uh, you have no CPU intensive query on uh, this stocked uh, in 100% worker and so on. The problem is it actually works with all, all shared buffers, and that's not the normal thing for Postgres. So the good idea is, like we call it, switch NUMA off. Uh, of course, it's impossible to switch NUMA off because it's uh, hardware architecture, but uh, we can switch a NUMA support in the operating system or in BIOS or uh, using NUMA Catel. So, uh, we can actually um, uh, try to figure out what is going on. We use NumaCatel and we take a look how many zones do we have. And uh, in one case, uh, we have lots of CPUs uh, in different nodes, uh, or we have all the CPUs in one node. So um, for Postgres, actually, uh, it's a better idea to make Linux think that we have one node and use interleaf. That means randomly access memory uh, like uh, this is non-NUMA architecture. <coughs> and surprisingly for uh, Postgres, it uh, works uh, better. Uh, that's actually confusing because if you Google uh, you will find lots of recipes like enable NUMA, NUMA is very good. Uh, in particular, uh, upper engineers who work with uh, uh, hypervisors like uh, VMware, uh, they just advise use um, NUMA, it's, it works well, but only for software which are aware of uh, how to work with NUMA. Uh, Important thing is actually that uh, I would say that during the third versions of Linux kernel, the problems were much worse. 
So uh, if you run on the model kernel like 4.4, 4.10, uh, most likely you will have less problems with NUMA if, even if it is enabled. Uh, this is because of uh, much more effective I.O. scheduling, uh, because of much more effective um, CPU scheduling. But, well, still, my suggestion, if you have lots of memory uh, and you run Postgres, uh, switch uh, NUMA support completely. It's much safer. In spite of the situation how uh, kernel can handle this, uh, it's much better with uh, recent versions of uh, Linux kernel. So it, it, it's a not the recipe, just uh, use the new kernel and be happy. Uh, you still can run into problems. Uh, which uh, way you will use, it, it, it's up to you. I would say uh, the, this approach works quite well. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, how uh, Linux works with uh, memory allocation? Uh, the fundamental problem is Again, software developers. <laughs> for software developers, sorry guys, <laughs> for software developers, uh, there is a very good convenient concept which calls uh, virtual memory. And the concept is very easy. Just we have infinite amount of memory which we can allocate and deallocate as we want. Uh, but in real life, it doesn't work because uh, this uh, CPU can actually operate virtual memory because our operating system allows that to do and it's designed to do that. But this stupid piece of memory, anyway, still has uh, stupid outdated physical addressing uh, for the terms of uh, efficiency. And at some point we need to mm, go from the virtual addressing to the physical addressing. That's only the first problem with concept of virtual memory, but uh, this is already a problem. And um, that's probably okay uh, if we have small amount of memory. But if we have lots of memory, uh, we need to perform this operation quite frequently. And this operation became an overhead. So how it goes? Uh, we go to the specific unit, which calls memory management unit, and say we, we want this page. Uh, what it does actually, or if there is no that page, it actually goes to the memory, uh, to the page table, look for it, uh, make uh, the allocation, and so on. Uh, but then it stores this result of this conversion in uh, so-called TLB, or uh, translation lookaside buffer. Uh, as usual, this uh, schema is quite simplified. There are more than one TLB. Uh, there, there are lots of things uh, and details how it works. But for us, the important thing is uh, this expensive operation is actually uh, cached in the cache. So like every cache, it has problems. Uh, if it becomes too big, it becomes inefficient. And we run into cache misses. Uh, we have a huge overhead on uh, TLB in, spe in, in spite of uh, TLB has actually its limits to it cannot grow uh, to the infinite size. Uh, it's still a problem if it's uh, quite huge. So um, the idea is it's not very efficient to allocate pages uh, like with those four key uh, small chunks. Uh, like uh, four kilobytes, it's really small chunk. It's convenient to have this small allocation uh, unit, but well, mm, if we need to allocate memory for shared buffers, which is uh, 64 gigs, uh, it's quite stupid to allocate uh, this size by these small chunks, uh, because the TLB would be huge and inefficient, uh, and so on. So uh, for um, this uh, idea, there is the concept of huge pages in uh, a Linux kernel. And most likely, if you have more than 8 gigs, more than uh, 16 gigs of uh, shared buffers, you need to allocate those shared buffers uh, through 
the huge pages mechanism. Uh, not only for that reason, the another reason uh, about this I will cover in the next slide. Uh, the idea is you have larger chunks and that's more efficient. Uh, you need to turn them in Linux kernel, uh, you need to say Postgres, you need to um, use uh, memory shared buffers allocation from the uh, huge pages segment, allocated with huge pages, but well, it works. Um, the another big problem of uh, working with memory and IO is actually uh, the overall concept of how uh, Linux uh, allocates and uh, make, make it free again, uh, the memory. We have some piece of memory. Uh, suppose we already have some shared buffers allocated from this memory with huge pages or not, doesn't matter in this stage, but uh, the rest of memory, it's a dynamical thing. Uh, and for those uh, sort operations, for hashing operations, for uh, just uh, compiling the uh, PG SQL, we need uh, some amount of memory and they consume that and uh, it becomes free again. Uh, how it works? There are different mechanisms uh, which if not configured correctly, can be a huge pain with databases. Uh, we have so-called free lists. Uh, we take the one, one of them as an example, but really there are many of them, one per numenod actually, and so on. Um, the idea is, from the head of the list, we can explicitly call uh, malloc, or then we can call free and put the pages uh, to the head of the list or get them from the head of the list uh, if they are pre-allocated. But this is a manually controlled thing. If the developers write bad software uh, which do not free the memory correctly, you know, the, this free list shrinks from the head. Uh, or if they really need this memory for, for some reason. For example, uh, if you have uh, queries which run a lot of uh, sorts uh, in the memory or things like that, you will constantly allocate those memory and uh, there would be not enough memory here and freely shrinks and you cannot afford more memory. Uh, what Linux does uh, to make this process more efficient, uh, it has uh, actually so-called page out daemon. Uh, if you remember in uh, previous versions of the uh, kernels, uh, it was, it was called uh, PD flush. There were different uh, variations of that, like CADA flush and so on. But the basic idea is that it's a page out daemon which uh, actually tries to figure out if we do not need this page any longer, if it sinks in the cache of operating system. So basically, the same database, but uh, not that complicated like Postgres uh, in the kernel. So basically, it's uh, the same idea like background writer, actually. Uh, it uh, takes those pages to the end of free list, but it actually doesn't deallocate them completely. It just moves them to the free list uh, to show that uh, they are available for allocation. If someone needs those pages, they can be allocated uh, and used. Uh, but if we need these pages uh, in the memory again, someone calls this page and so on, uh, and it's still here and not allocated, uh, the page out daemon can reclaim that back and actually use this thing. So it's, it's some sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, like emergency plug in the bathtub, like uh, you can uh, put it uh, back and uh, if you need some memory, up to a certain point, you, you, you can allocate that from free list. Uh, this is the first mechanism uh, what to do with lack of memory if, if we need to allocate more and we run out of memory. Another mechanism is actually swap. Uh, today swap is the mechanism still 
in use. And the basic idea is if we need more pages, uh, we can try to uh, swap some pages to the disk. Then we can try to allocate the free space uh, for the new request for memory. And uh, if someone free the, this memory, we are safe. Uh, if someone calls those things from the disk, we can get that to the memory back. Uh, but it's actually, it, it's tricky. For database workload, it's unsafe to relay and swap. Because first problem is, imagine part of your shared buffers swapped. Uh, that's definitely a very bad case, because disk is slow and it doesn't work. Uh, if you are smart enough and you remember my previous slide and use uh, huge pages to allocate uh, shared buffers, that's not a big problem because if it is allocated through huge pages, it would not go to the swap. But for all the rest of the memory, it's, it's true. It can go to the swap and, for example, uh, you try to uh, run, a query, uh, run a query which uh, uses sort of uh, on the disk uh, to uh, improve performance, you increase work mem, uh, and the query is still run on the disk but doesn't say about this uh, because theoretically it's in memory, but this amount of pages heated actually swap, and everything will be very slow in this case. So you don't want this, and uh, you need actually to regulate uh, the swap with uh, VM swappiness parameter. Uh, but be careful, uh, uh, things can be worse if you use this parameter wrongly. I will tell how to use that. Uh, so basically, it's, it, it's a very complicated uh, balanced system. Uh, you have a page out daemon which can help to reclaim. You, you can have swap which help to actually to protect uh, your uh, operating system from killing processes. Because it, it's actually the emergency measure. If, if you run out of memory, you need to kill some process which consumes memory. Uh, to prevent those things, we have those two mechanisms, which try to free some memory and to survive this uh, emergency situation. If not, uh, we have uh, a beautiful solution uh, called OM killer, out of memory killer, which, uh, well, it's most efficient way to free memory in Linux. So it, it <laughs> no process, no problem, <laughs> a lot of memory. <laughs> uh, but most likely if it's a database server, you don't want that. Uh, so um, how it works? Uh, the basic idea is try to page out try to swap or try to kill. Otherwise, nothing to do than kernel panic. Uh, so what we can do from the DBA point of view if we have this knowledge about how th all those things work. Um, page out happens if something calls fsync. Uh, we know who can do that in Postgres, uh, so basically uh, we can be happy about that, but you know, um, the problem is uh, that our shared buffers are not subject of uh, page out. So if we properly allocated that with huge pages, uh, we just in case can free some memory uh, issuing the same with sync, uh, but uh, we cannot predict this and, well, we can hope that that would work. Uh, if 30 seconds timeout exceeded, uh, you can actually change this parameter, but uh, it doesn't help a lot to change that uh, too much. Uh, or if there are too many dirty pages, which is regulated by those parameters of them dirty, background ratio uh, or dirty ratio or complementary parameters in bytes. Um, but I would say that uh, then we used to use rotating disks or SSDs with uh, conventional rate controllers with uh, better rebate cache. I don't know, um, I think many of you still have one or two servers with uh, rate controller with better rebate cache, but well, if you use more than SSDs, that's, that's part of history actually. It's not that efficient anymore and most likely you won't use that. Uh, 
in those old times we recommended to tune those parameters but today I would not say that's a very uh, actually useful thing. I take a look if I have those on slides. Okay, uh, then I, I don't know. Um, how many people do use rate controller with battery based cache? So should I, should I explain how it works? Well, let's go. Uh, if after I explain how to do that with um, SSDs, you will have this question and we have time, I can return to this. Actually, uh, because the basic idea, um, any parameters which are by default uh, here uh, are quite good for modern SSDs. So because uh, modern SSDs can write tremendous amount of data, that's quite okay. Uh, previously with uh, old rate controllers, we need to tune that because they are crazy large for rate controllers. Uh, when uh, we need to deal with swap correctly because uh, as I said, if uh, some part of the memory which isn't used by the database isn't swap, it's a bad idea. First thing is overcommit memory. You can uh, overcommit it uh, always um, or commit based on some dark magic or do not recommit at all. Uh, this is the best, the safest parameter for uh, your database system. Because what, what does it mean to overcommit memory? Overcommit memory is this concept of virtual memory. Uh, operating system thinks that virtual memory consists of memory and swap and actually performs no action if we go to swap. Uh, operating system thinks that swap is as fast as uh, your memory and just uses like, oh, we have double amount of RAM. That's not for databases. That's obviously will be too slow and uh, that's the worst case. Based on the heuristic is actually not very good as well because uh, you cannot control that obviously. So my suggestion is do not overcommit at all and that's it. So you basically can regulate in which cases your uh, operating system will use uh, swap anyway, but you can minimize those. Uh, so this parameter to two. Uh, min three kilobytes. Uh, that can be reasonably high, but actually if you try to put that uh, very high, <laughs> you will end up with kernel panic, <laughs> most likely. Uh, check the manuals for your exact kernel about this parameter, but the idea is like um, for normal server with, I don't know, 64 gigs of memory, 128 uh, half terabyte or something like this, this figure is quite okay. Uh, we just get that uh, with uh, troubleshooting some customers uh, at some point and trying to increase that because uh, People often have uh, some applications which cannot work for uh, PG balancer and connection brokers like that. Uh, and that's why lots of connections, lots like uh, sorts, uh, hashing, uh, and so on. And for this fork memory, uh, we run out of memory and that's a problem when Kira comes and kill the database. So uh, for those purposes, we experimented with this parameter and uh, actually find out that uh, it's not that bad. So it doesn't cause immediate um, OM killer, but uh, it's large enough. And if it's large enough, uh, the free list contains enough of uh, pages ready for allocation. So those uh, sorts, hashing and so on, they work fast because um, operating system allocates memory faster. So that's maybe a good idea to increase that slightly comparing to default. The other confusing parameters is uh, VM swappiness, which regulates actually uh, the ratio. Uh, in which case, uh, operating system will go to swap or still relay on page out. So um, before uh, early kernels of version three, uh, the general rule was to just switch up the swap uh, by putting zero here. It actually uh, it worked, but then the behavior of the kernel changed a bit. 
And it became a problem because uh, if you completely switch uh, swap off, if something happens, uh, Owen Killer will kill something on your database server. Uh, this something actually most likely would be a database on um, an X flight or in two flights, I will explain why, but uh, it's not the behavior you would like uh, to experience. Uh, so default is 60, like in 60% uh, operating system will use swap instead of relaying on the page out. That's actually a reasonable behavior, for example, for desktop with large amount of memory because who knows if page out helps, if it would be possible to free enough memory. So we'll be on the safe side and uh, we use swap a bit and that's okay overall in terms of performance that, that's okay. For database server it's bad because swap, disk, slow, sad. So that's, that, that, that's a bad idea. Uh, and hundreds is all, I just put that on this slide to, to show what, what does actually mean. So in this case, the operating system would not be away on um, page out, it just put everything to swap, and that's, that's bad. That's not for a database system and not for a normal work. Uh, so you see, if you have large amount of memory and uh, your system is slightly in swap, most likely you have uh, VM swapping is by default 60, and that means uh, you need to change that for maximizing uh, benefits from large amount of memory. OM killer, one of the favorite uh, process, uh, one of the favorite syscalls, or well, uh, subsystems uh, for DBAs. Uh, this is actually uh, the most efficient, as I said, mechanism of free memory, of free memory in Linux. Uh, it has some priorities, uh, and uh, those list of priorities, if you take a look uh, into the kernel source code for OM killer, uh, looks like this. Swap a flag, uh, which I don't know. Somebody used that with databases like sw swap on, swap off uh, manually. I, I believe you don't do that. Um, but this is not our case. That's not the case of databases. Theoretically, you can say to a process, w w this process should not be swapped. Uh, but it doesn't work like uh, it sounds. Uh, basically, uh, it causes lots of problems. So it's not actually. Uh, our case. Um, another priority which process to kill is process with a lot of child processes. And uh, another priority, the least one, is non-root process. Uh, what do you think? Which process uh, is okay from those criteria on the database server? Yeah, that, that, that's actually, that, that, that's a mugshot of a Postgres. So it's like uh, Lots of processes from one single postmaster, most likely it would be killed. <laughs> so OM killer is a bad idea for you. <laughs> and uh, don't let uh, your uh, database to be killed. But the reasonable question, what, what to do? Uh, we need lots of memory to maximize our IO performance and so on. What we can do? Um, at this point, many people ask why we cannot just disable uh, OM killer. But this is even worse, because if you take a look on the name of the system KTL parameter, which switches it effectively off, uh, you probably will suggest, well, it's a bad idea. Because uh, the choice is very simple. Or you have OM killing for a certain process, or you have kernel panic. Uh, both are not a nice experience for DBA. But I suggest, actually, based on experience, that OM kill is better. Because, uh, at least in the logs, you can find out that what happened. But if you have a kernel panic, the troubleshooting what actually was the reason for this kernel panic is much more complicated, and most likely um, you can actually not figure out what is going on, uh, especially if you have a uh, large swap, large amount of memory, and so on. So don't try to do that. There are some suggestions like um, uh, adjust the priorities how OM killer work, but well, my point of uh, view is that you actually better not experiment with this. Try to keep 
enough memory. If uh, all of your memory is consumed by shared buffers and you have no enough memory for uh, processes, for work memory, you need to rethink your settings for your Postgres. Decrease slightly amount of shared buffers, take a look how it works, uh, uh, take a big stick and explain uh, how to use explain to the software drivers, and so on. Um, no, do not try to, um, uh, to, f to use the concept of virtual memory literally. Uh, it's, it's not true. Physical memory is physical memory, so uh, you cannot uh, afford more memory than you have on your machine. So uh, those recipes are bad recipes. Uh, oh, another part, uh, how Linux works with disks. Uh, and that can be actually uh, another huge part. Uh, so I suggest actually another five minute stop and then we will take the last path up to the end. And if you have questions about those things, you're welcome to ask.
So let's proceed. I think. So our final part, but I think most important, <laughs> uh, it's in some way it's less practical maybe in spite of that would be lots of practical stuff, but uh, it's more like uh, we need to figure out what to wait from Linux development next years, uh, which actually the pace they took uh, is incredibly fast, so uh, it's really interesting what to do uh, with all those new developments for Rust like DBAs. So uh, first things first. Uh, then the X4 file system was introduced with a uh, barrier enabled by default. Uh, it was golden age for PostgreSQL consultors because uh, people show up in panic, say, well, the disk performance is uh, crazy slow and uh, you can help them in 15 minutes and charge immediately lots of money because it was really easy to, uh, to solve the problem. The problem was actually uh, uh, the idea of uh, write barriers in uh, modern file systems. Uh, what is this, how it works? Uh, basically, modern file systems like XFS, like 6.4, uh, it's sort of a database uh, on its own. So it's have uh, the analog of write ahead log, it have uh, the analog of pages, but they are not the pages, they are inodes. Uh, but the principle is the same. Uh, idea is that you have lots of uh, duty data in kernel buffer. Uh, you write uh, those uh, data to, to the disks. Uh, and for file system, it's important to write the data and the journal as well. And the problem is, from point of view of kernel buffer, that's the same stupid pages. Uh, and um, for operating system, is, uh, it is incorrect behavior if uh, we take the data, put it to the disk, uh, return success, but we are missing of journal data for this data. So basically that means we cannot recover this uh, file system if uh, the crash occurs. Uh, and this is a problem because uh, normally you remember if uh, you start your desktop with Linux uh, and something goes wrong, it, it checks the disk, uh, recovers from the journal, and that, that's okay. Otherwise, it would be broken, and that, that's bad. It's basically like PostgreSQL without wall. But the problem is, for desktop, it's, well, it's quite okay. For the server with huge amount of RAM, it's bad because um, you can have somewhere here your data for inodes and somewhere here on the top of huge kernel buffer, which is basically the size of your shared buffers at least, uh, like 128 gigs or something like this, you can have the journal data. Uh, and you can wait quite long until this journal data hit the disk. And if the problem occurs uh, between the data hits the disk and the journal hit the disk, uh, you are screwed because uh, you have no journal data to recover. It's a problem. Uh, the mechanism which was designed for that uh, has a name, uh, right barrier. Uh, this is basically Cisco, uh, which uh, issues by the kernel if there is data without journal. Uh, and uh, to get this journal, kernel start to uh, resource this uh, kernel buffer to get this journal data and to write it first. So you can imagine on the size of modern uh, RAM, uh, how long can it take to resort everything to get the correct journal thing? Uh, and what, what is going on with the performance of your disks in this case. So um, this is the first point. The second is uh, that journal is pretty much very inefficient uh, in case of uh, modern database server because 
most likely, well, I say you, you should, uh, most likely you use uh, something with uh, the battery or capacitor or any source of uh, additional uh, safe measures for your disks. Uh, the idea is simple. If you have some cache on disk to speed up the writes, like on RAID controller with a battery or on SSD, uh, you have fast piece of uh, memory, which is non-volatile. So basically, uh, if electricity goes down, you lose your data. But if on a RAID controller you put a small battery, like in your smartphone, like it used to be in your smartphone, now it's all all inside. Uh, it has enough energy to keep your data uh, until you restart your machine um, and uh, it can be really written from the cache to the disk. On the SSD it's even better. They have uh, now the capacitor. It's literally a capacitor. It has small portion of electricity, quite enough to uh, back up your um, data from the cache to the persistent memory uh, and it's much more efficient than old-style battery because uh, for battery you need to monitor it, you need to uh, check if it works, you need to change that from time to time, uh, and, and so on. Uh, for the capacitor, well, uh, it lives longer than your disk. So basically uh, the mechanism I is quite good. So um, in this case, actually uh, the journaling is worthless. Because uh, if uh, you have a problem with your uh, capacitor on the cache, if it's broken, uh, journal doesn't save you because uh, operating system gets proper response only uh, relying on that disk is up and running and it's everything okay with this disk. So basically, journal guarantees nothing in this case. Um, with the battery, same thing. Uh, you actually rely on what sort of response you get from hardware. So basically, if you have proper disks with supercapacitor or battery backed cache on the RAID controller, uh, barrier is not for you. You can easily switch it off, and uh, the performance increases drastically, and you have no problem with that. Uh, but, well, I if you do not have uh, those types of disks, if you have a cheap desktop SSD or if you have a uh, RAID controller without battery, that's another case. In this case, uh, you actually need to use this journal. But, well, we're talking about uh, performance problems. If you want to deal with performance problems, you need to use proper hardware. There is no chance to, uh, to build a real database server for LTP on the commodities of uh, hardware. Uh, another uh, thing uh, which is very useful and which should be kept in mind, uh, that this system with supercapacitor which I described, it's actually a good case for the proper uh, disks like uh, enterprise level Intel series. Uh, if you buy somewhere a cheap uh, disk, uh, you you cannot know if there is capacitor where, uh, how to check this, uh, is there a utility with that checks that it works. So um, all those things are about uh, good server-grade disks uh, because actually um, a cheap uh, disk uh, like uh, consumer level Samsung and things like that uh, they even worse than uh, SASIS because SAS can be slow, but those disks are unreliable. And all these uh, uh, advices are actually about the enterprise grade disks because otherwise you cannot be sure that your data is safe. Uh, so the common question which file system? I would say uh, X4 or XFS. Many D uh, DBAs actually appreciate XFS because. Uh, it's convenient uh, in use and uh, it development process is quite fast. Uh, but, well, I would say if you have X4, there is no reason to run for XFS and vice versa. So basically, if you have X2 for some reason, uh, most likely you need uh, 
first of all, uh, update your kernel, uh, definitely. And you need to disable uh, quite, uh, write barrier. Uh, no time, obviously, because if your file system measures access time, uh, that, that's a significant performance penalty. Well, the main picture for this part is Linux IOS tech. Uh, and I added actually as it used to look like. Uh, it still has uh, some legacy parts uh, which I would say uh, w uh, they need to keep for, for a while. But, well, that's a general principle and we will see how it evolves actually. We have uh, our user space with uh, database, memory, all the memory like work mem, maintenance work mem, shared buffers and so on. And to hit the disks, we need to go through all this stack. Uh, first part of the stack is virtual file system. Uh, that's a common interface to interact with every file system in Linux. Uh, so um, that's design abstraction, and you can actually control that using these VM uh, parameters and so on. Uh, and beneath of this, you have your favorite file system. I, again, suggest XFS or X4 um, because for terms of performance, it's much better. Uh, I pretty much think that many of you try to use uh, ZFS for some reasons like compression or easy provisioning or something like this. But uh, if we talk about performance, most likely uh, we need uh, to get rid of those convenience things like uh, transparent provisioning and things like that. So uh, I would say file system, and basically uh, you have two ways how to interact uh, through this layer to the underneath kernel layer of um, block input output. Uh, so it's the dedicated layer which actually operates with uh, the same, practically the same pages, uh, and which weight interacts with the driver and with the disks. Uh, you can use direct IO or you can use page cache. Uh, in case of Postgres, you most likely use uh, page cache. Why most likely, I would say, at the last slide of this tutorial at the end, uh, because the direct IO is uh, a small topic which we need to cover anyway. Uh, with the page cache, we first put uh, data to the page cache, then it goes further. Uh, with direct IO, we uh, go not through a file system practically, but directly underneath. Anyway, uh, then we have a uh, block IO layer. Then we form actually uh, the special structures, uh, bio actually, block IO. That's a structure with blocks which goes to the write request, for example, or for write request. And after that, we have so called request layer. Uh, request layer is actually uh, the tier uh, where um, this uh, abstraction of the pages and so on, uh, it turns out to be uh, a set of commands for, uh, which, which is acceptable by the driver to write the actual data. Because uh, disks uh, with drivers like SCSI driver, they still operate uh, things like cylinders and so on, and we need to make a conversion uh, from pages to the cylinders and those comments. Um, actually, this part is pretty much very inefficient uh, because um, you need to make some optimizations and calculations how efficiently put uh, different different blocks on maybe on the same area of the disk or maybe to minimize the movement of the magnetic heads. Uh, and for this purpose, we have a so-called IO scatterer or elevator, uh, like it used, used to be. So uh, in, this, uh, in this part, I, I say about that we need to convert to cylinders and so on. And that actually means that uh, this part of IO stack is very archaic. Uh, so it's, it's not very modern. Uh, and in the request where we've elevated, we basically do like uh, 
uh, we, we take uh, uh, lots of blocks we need and we construct the vector of uh, those blocks to form a write request and then go to the disk. Uh, so on all those things we need to tune something or to rework something to make our databases efficient. Uh, in the old times of Linux kernel 2.6, uh, everything was quite easy. There was so-called Linus elevator. Uh, don't uh, mix it up with uh, Linus scheduler. The Linus scheduler is for uh, CPU scheduler. This one is for uh, I.O. and, well, they have things in common. Uh, they were quite old, quite primitive, and Linus insisted they are beautiful. Uh, so for a long time, nobody touched them. <laughs> uh, and um, basic idea was let's take different structures uh, we need to put to the disk and form the vectors based on some ideas uh, how to put them together, to put that on the same part of the disk or something like this. Uh, well, it was not very efficient, but for that time, then it was invented, it worked at, at the certain uh, point, and that was basically merging and sorting. Like, we take a different I request, we take a look on the pages, sort them, uh, merge several vectors with pages into one, and put that. But this um, scheduler had a lot of problems. And uh, the main problem was so-called servation. Then we optimize uh, disks to afford this amount of merged uh, input. Uh, we immediately uh, hit into a problem then uh, we cannot read because disk turns to a different side. So this scheduler was uh, good for read or write. So basically uh, it it cannot uh, uh, do the thing simultaneously. So basically, it was only a very simple, naive method, I would say. Uh, because of that, people started to redo the things, and uh, between kernel 2.6 and early versions uh, 3, etc., uh, there are several schedulers uh, which basically um, developed the idea of Linus Elevator to, uh, to some point, well, uh, I would say. Uh, first of them, not in chronological order, just uh, like, like we use them from time to time, uh, was uh, complete fair queuing, queuing uh, or CFQ, uh, which was actually not bad generic scheduler. Uh, and that mean uh, generic scheduler that uh, it was actually designed for desktop environment. Like, imagine you have desktop or laptop, you're listening uh, music, uh, there were times when it consumes significant amount of resources, you compile in Postgres, uh, you write in something uh, in email client and so on and so on. So you perform very different uh, amount of uh, operations and this is very unpredictable workload. So if you run in database with checkpoints, uh, well, you can actually tune the things to, to work good with that. But if you have desktop workload, who knows what next, yeah? So uh, it's, it's uh, a very uh, strange approach in this case. So. Um, the idea was uh, easy. Let's have um, some amount of uh, write queues and um, based on which process from which terminal uh, runs uh, this uh, write or read request, we put to the different uh, query. Uh, well, um, it works up to a certain moment, but for desktops. Uh, first of all, because a final output query was pretty much the single. Uh, because if we have SCSI driver, we basically need to serialize all those writes to the final output query, and this is actually very slow. The another problem was that uh, basically um, we, it was not parallel. So basically uh, we have one input query, 
in spite of we have lots of them theoretically up to 64 in late implementations because we take um, one CPU and it works with one uh, query and it takes um, some write request from certain application from certain uh, TTY and put to this query. So basically it became uh, a very straightforward non-parallel thing like um, imagine Postgres in this case. Postgres uh, runs from one user uh, forked from one uh, process uh, from one TTY. So basically uh, Postgres would end up with practically one uh, write request queue and it doesn't work. So um, for some average workload that was not a bad decision but it was not efficient uh, anyway and uh, we uh, actually suggested to use that if you have your database server with SATA disks or something like this. So uh, anyway, we cannot talk about any uh, performance in this case. But well, it's still not a bad choice for, for example, uh, the machine there, uh, software developers testing the things, it was quite good uh, 10 years ago. So it worked. Uh, the deadline is, was actually uh, pretty much the same, but slightly more efficient uh, because, uh, uh, to be honest, it made uh, less activity on merging and sorting. And that's why, uh, actually, it, it was more efficient for the database workload. But uh, actually, the final development on this, of this concept was uh, so-called NOOP or NAN. Uh, and uh, NOOP... Um, as it falls from the uh, name, it actually the um, scheduler which does nothing, <laughs> uh, no scheduling at all, because all those scheduling were designed for high latency uh, disks. So basically, if you have rotating disks, uh, those merging and sorting can make sense. But if you have low latency things like SSDs, like fiber channel disk arrays. Uh, better not to uh, try to optimize that in the way like you try to optimize for uh, rotating disks. So um, finally we end up to using up to early third versions uh, loop for uh, SSDs or uh, for disk arrays just because two hours w were actually screwing the things up. Uh, nothing good was about those sh scheduling. Uh, after version 3.13, uh, the situation was changed because uh, the huge uh, amount of work was done by kernel developers uh, to substitute significant part of this Linux IOS stack with uh, a new approach uh, which called BulkMQ and and VME. Uh, and uh, now actually the work is not finished, but uh, we already can use many of those work in production. And what is this uh, and how we can use that, we'll talk uh, next half an hour, I think, or maybe slightly faster. So because of Noob was actually the most effective scheduler, uh, the another approach was taken, and um, the scheduler we call bulk MQ, but it's actually it's not a scheduler. It's substitution of the scheduler and the entire uh, request layer. So it's basically uh, it's a subsystem uh, which works with modern I/O. Uh, what was um, started? So what's an idea of bulk MQ? Uh, it's a subsystem which is specifically designed for low latency, high parallel storage. So uh, it's already designed with the thirds of SSD. Because the progress of um, uh, non-SSDs was crazy over the uh, last five years, uh, it, uh, it needs a different approach. Uh, the idea is it's too parallel. So it has uh, lots of uh, uh, queues, those queues are uh, 
actually very long, so we can put a lot of information in those queues. Uh, and uh, every CPU can work with HQ, and uh, that it's much more efficient. So the old approach to elevators was like this. CPU works with a single queue, or we can extend this with several queues to work pretty much with the same disk because the output queue is the same. So um, that doesn't work quite well. The modern approach is basically we have a disk which can get a lot of uh, parallel write requests, and that's why we have uh, use, uh, lots of queues and lots of CPU can work with this simultaneously. Uh, part of this challenge was that actually uh, at that point, it was 2012, 2013 like this, uh, the popularity of uh, virtual things uh, like VMware and things like that uh, start growing. And uh, if you remember, still for virtual environment, IO is a big problem. So basically, uh, you can probably achieve good throughput, but the latency is still unstable and you have lots of problems with database workload because virtual IO uh, that's unstable latency and that doesn't work that well. One of the problem was that actually uh, you have very ancient IO stack and uh, if you have 20 virtual machines, how you can prioritize this IO, how you can actually do that in parallel. And part of this effort was actually the idea, okay, we take uh, this queue and designate this to this virtual machine, which is with database. And we give the high priority for this input-output queue. And uh, those two, which are PHP backend, now, they do not need that amount of IO and they work uh, just like they work. Um, and this one would be pretty fast. So um, they used the technology called uh, tags for uh, input-output queue, which allows to prioritize these things. Uh, so to return to uh, bulk MQ, the idea is, yeah, uh, it's truly parallel and it works well. Uh, and uh, it works actually together with uh, NVMe. NVMe is uh, actually the set of standards. So it's basically not uh, the exact technology, but it's a set of standards, uh, which is quite good, I, f I find, because before that, the set of standards was, was SCSI, which is outdated for database needs for years. Um, and the, uh, the idea is that is the specification how to uh, work with um, uh, storage driver, which is specifically designed for uh, modern SSDs, with high parallelism and uh, things like that. Uh, pretty much uh, every modern SSD uh, can work uh, using uh, current third generation of NVMe standards. So if you take a look on the PCI Express Intels like modern Aptana and things like that, they utilize those uh, standards. Uh, and that makes actually things much better for us database uh, people. Uh, currently, uh, I don't remember exactly, I believe it's around uh, 12 or 16 gigabits per second uh, with current uh, third generation. But actually, generation 4 and generation 5, they are already ready, uh, non-production ready actually, because it's a very new development. But version 5 allows up to uh, 32 gigabytes per second. So it's it's big difference with uh, SCSI or Fiber Channel or anything else, and um, modern um, PCIe SSDs are um, available on different form factors, and basically you can uh, put them in a disk array and uh, use of a Fiber Channel using NVMe because current development of NVMe is actually not just to be a local rate. Uh, on a terator, lo local thing uh, inserted in uh, PCI Express uh, slot. Uh, it can actually work now through the Fiber channel, which actually very good for enterprises because they have existing infrastructure of Fiber channel arrays and you can substitute one with another and gradually migrate to the new disk. Um, 
So the problem is actually that maybe databases is not that ready for NVMe uh, and uh, user software like it should be. Um, so uh, the idea is to take uh, the significant part of Linux IOS tech and substitute it to NVMe. And that actually makes uh, disks, SSDs closer to the CPU because the most idea is uh, like modern SSD, it's just like you have one memory type and another memory type and you can write from one to another w without any things like uh, block IO, things like that. Uh, but it turns to be uh, a problem now because uh, Postgres, for example, relies on the POSIX. And I don't remember if you saw the recent thread about FSync issues with Postgres. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's one of the, uh, actually, one of the problems uh, to use the modern kernels and relay on POSIX. So basically, uh, internal mechanism changes drastically, and if previously we thought that uh, if we issue fsync and it fails, we can issue that another time, and if it doesn't fail, it works. But it's no longer the true. <laughs> and uh, if uh, we uh, issue that fsync and we fail, we need to panic because, well, input-output system doesn't work. But Postgres doesn't do that currently, and developers actually figuring out what, what to do with that because uh, there were several cases then it caused uh, data corruption. They are quite rare, but well, still, still it's possible. Um, why uh, things are changed that much with NVMe? Uh, the, the main reason from my point of view is uh, that uh, latency is minimized to uh, to really, really fast uh, speed. So um, if we take a look uh, how it was before, we have um, our user space with our Postgres. And we have a kernel. At the user space, we issue write, fsync, read, or another system call. What's going on then? Um, all right, let me go. Uh, we go to the uh, virtual file system X4, uh, BOR, and so on. And here we perform um, our write vector to put it to hardware. So we issued sys syscall and now we actually formed the actual write to the hardware and put it to, through the driver. I don't know, driver, for example. And beneath to, to hardware. And here we actually issue some low level commands to write the data at the hardware level. Uh, how we can do that? We actually only can wait for the interruption RQ. Um, and here we wait, wait, wait. Then interruption came and handler uh, works with that. And at some point it returns to the kernel and say, okay, we've done. We have written these things. And after that, kernel responses to the user space and says, you have sync is finished. That's how it worked that time. But the problem is, there are a lot of context switches between those levels, you know, constant, uh, context switches, context switches, context switches. Uh, then. Here we had a rotating disk with uh, mechanics which goes back and forth. Uh, that was no problem because the context switch, well, they add uh, one thousandth of the percent to the wall operation. Now, this layer is extremely fast. So going through all those things with um, 
interruption is crazy slow for us because we can afford lots of writes here and if we wait for each interruption that takes a lot of time. Uh, so, but this is actually how POSIX thinks things are going on, like FSync works. Now, uh, in, I believe, from version 4.10, uh, or maybe 4.4, uh, in the NVMe driver, uh, the polling mechanism was introduced. What's polling in this context? It's the way how to get rid of this. So basic idea is, we wait here, and at some point we start to ask, are we ready without waiting for this one? And if we are, we return earlier and save a lot of time at this point. Uh, problem is, if we pull constantly, uh, the CPU would be 100% utilized. That's not the thing we like. That's why behind of this, there is lots of work like um, no weight spinning here between poles to not pull constantly and so on and so on. So uh, this behavior is actually much more complicated than just wait for interrupt. And um, if something fails here, for example, we do not know what to do. Uh, because uh, our database is designed for standard POSIX specification, like wait for this one and then return. So the whole IO stack is actually reworked to, to the state we need to change something in the database. So it would be very challenging uh, next couple of years to work with Postgres and with our databases because we need to change that things. Uh, anyway, uh, don't think that NVMe is bad. <laughs> it's actually very good. Uh, if you uh, try to take a modern kernel like for something, uh, use a drive supported by NVMe, any modern Intel SSD for example, uh, and you check if you have a uh, bulk MQ scheduler, which is actually default scheduler for uh, any NVMe driver nowadays. And you can check that. It would be designated as snoop in the scheduler for this device, but don't believe that. It's bulk MQ uh, if it is NVMe driver. Uh, you can actually achieve, uh, well, uh, 100 times uh, more performance uh, or something like that. So it, it's basically, it's very effective. So uh, you can try uh, to take some part of workload from the server which you use SSDs through the RAID controller and put that to NVMe and the difference in performance is incredible. So basically it's the future which is already here. So uh, if you need uh, performance, that's what you need. So, and, and I believe that actually in spite of uh, this uh, NVMe schema has still compatibility with uh, block I.O., with page cache, uh, it's a thing for, to, to support the legacy things. Otherwise, we cannot run Postgres on the kernel 4.10, uh, but we still can. Uh, and, well, it, it's a good development. Uh, another problem is actually at some point, they can start to think that, okay, we need to implement partially direct I.O. To, to make the things more effective. And as far as I know, they already think that. <laughs> uh, that can be a problem for Postgres because Postgres cannot work with direct I.O. But it's, that's a different story. So, um, to finish with uh, this part, uh, finally, uh, I need to say some things about direct I.O. Uh, what's basically direct I.O.? It's uh, the way how to get rid of uh, buffer I.O., to not put the pages uh, to the page cache, but directly bypassing the page cache, put them to the disk. Uh, the idea is great. So most of the databases now use direct I.O. in this or that way. 
uh, even MySQL will do that uh, because they support on Linux uh, for that. Uh, that makes things more, much more simple. Uh, the problem is that Postgres actually can uh, use Direct.io for write ahead log. Uh, you basically can enable Direct.io for write ahead log. Well, actually, Postgres do that for you automatically. But it will switch it off if you uh, use anything uh, for the wall level except of, uh, like, like it called today, minimal or. Uh, the idea is if you use um, hiving or hot standby, uh, ODirect is no more safe. So Postgres automatically switch it off. And you cannot benefit from Direct.io if you have backup enabled or if you have uh, replication enabled. Why? Why this uh, problem? The problem is if you open the file with ODirect flag, uh, you need to work with this file with ODirect flag. Then MySQL first introduced that. It was very funny because uh, someone comes up with um, backup utility or uh, MySQL dump uh, and the server crashes because it opened the InnoDB files with ODirect and if someone access those uh, files unaware that this is opened with ODirect and tries to work with them without, um, terrible things can happen. <laughs> so if the file was opened with a direct, it should be uh, handled only as file open with a direct. Uh, and that's the obvious reason why Postgres can use uh, a direct for wall to maximize performance. But it switched it off if um, we use replication or backup. Because um, if we use replication, we t take those files and hide them and send them. Uh, all those utilities are supposed to support direct I.O. And that's not true. So that's why this safety measure. And that actually explains why um, it requires a lot of development and why it's not implemented yet in spite of many PostgreSQL developers realize that quite well that... Uh, it's better to do something in this direction. Uh, the problem is uh, the design of the PostgreSQL. Because, OK, we can uh, teach um, PGDump to work with uh, Direct.io. We can teach uh, Replication to work with Direct.io. We can teach Backup Solutions to work with Direct.io. Stop. Hold on. We could not. Uh, and the reason for that is, for example, a Hive command. Uh, you have our hive command, and uh, it should be uh, working with Direct.io as well. But a hive command is basically any shell script you can put there. And that makes it actually impossible to uh, teach Postgres to work with Direct.io and only with Direct.io. First, we need to change the architecture to get rid of a hive command to make backup without this approach. Uh, and that's a problem, so that's, uh, that's why it requires a lot of development, and that's why Direct.io is not here. And besides of this, many developers, I think, okay, uh, Linus said that's a bad interface, uh, that's a bad idea, it's bad design, we do not use them. But, well, one and every database use that. So, uh, what else we can do? Uh, another problem for Postgres here is that um, the code which can enable Direct.io is very uh, operating system specific because it's basically it's a Linux specific uh, approach. Uh, so uh, if we need to implement something for another operating system, we basically need to duplicate this code. And that's actually uh, the holy cow of uh, working with Postgres because we need to support this coffee machine with OpenBSD, you remember. Uh, and that's why uh, we cannot maximize performance uh, on Linux. Uh, well, that's open source. Welcome to the world of open source. It has lots of different benefits, but this is definitely not the strongest side of open source. Um, but actually, I think at some point, uh, taking a look on the recent development of uh, Linux kernel in VME driver uh, and uh, hardware development, actually some steps should be done. Because, for example, there is a good optimization or atomic to speed up the 
uh, uh, SSDs, but we cannot use that because uh, this flag uh, can be used to open the file only if we open this file with ODirect. So they only come together. We cannot benefit from this optimization without ODirect. So that's a problem. And now we have a problem that actually Postgres maybe is the only database which is not using DirectIO. Well, uh, so that's about the DirectIO. And uh, as I said, uh, well, first, thanks to my colleagues who did lots of those research. One of them is here with Spy photo camera, <laughs> and you, if you're interested about uh, the topic, you can ask Alexei socially with a beer what he thinks about uh, modern Linux IOS tech. Uh, as I said, uh, if you want some supplementary material like presentation and some written list, uh, which covers more uh, useful talks, useful articles on the topic, drop me an email. Uh, I'm not supposed to respond right uh, uh, directly, but in two or three days, I think I sent you the presentation and the list uh, on my way back from the conference, or if I have uh, an hour to do that. Uh, and thank you for attending, and if you have questions, it's time for questions. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, 8, 16 gigs. So in these pages, is just the shared buffer memory that's in there, not like worse memory maintenance? Yeah, just shared buffers. Because actually, to use huge pages, you need to support of huge pages in the kernel and in the application. Postgres can support huge pages in modern versions, like uh, you set the specific Postgres code parameters uh, to use uh, huge pages to try on or off. So it basically means uh, how to um, allocate the uh, memory for shared buffers. So it's only for shared buffers. You cannot use that for shared memory, or for work mem. Hmm? Oh, well, um, it's a good idea not to overkill. So basically, uh, you have some, um, most likely you use some connection broker if you use Postgres, like PG pool, PG balancer, and uh, that means you know the size of your pool. So you can figure out, okay, I have shared memory like this, the rest is for work memory, Okay, I divide this that like this, and I leave some memory for super user connections, for example, to rebuild index concurrently, uh, the, because you need uh, maintenance workman for that. So um, the good idea is actually to figure out, okay, I have this and this. Uh, I allocate 128 gig, uh, megabytes per uh, worker for work member, for example. If you're sure that you have this memory, that's okay, because um, it's a lazy allocation. So basically, it's not like shared buffers allocates at once, and that's it. Uh, it only allocates that if you need. Another good idea is actually, if you take a look on uh, your PGStat statements report and take a look on your slow queries, if there is a problem that they perform sorting, uh, hashing on disk, and so on, you slightly can increase book memory and uh, see if uh, you get rid of the uh, queries with uh, usage of disk. Uh, if you get rid of them, that's good, that's okay. So mm, nothing to do to add more. Uh, well, um, if, if you take a, a look into um, device queue, uh, uh, this te text file uh, in the Linux, 
it says uh, noob or none. But is, actually, if it is an NVMe driver, it's uh, bulk MQ. It doesn't call like this. Uh, actually, in uh, recent development of NVMe driver, like uh, they called that driver Mark II, uh, which was released, I believe, last August or something like this, that actually the most of uh, new things in that version was uh, about supporting uh, NVMe over fiber channel. So it's basically the idea is you even can theoretically sh uh, share fiber channel for both SCSI and uh, NVMe. And as far as I know, it's uh, the, one of the huge goals of uh, NVMe development group to do that now. Because that, uh, that's really what industry needed. <coughs> You're welcome. More questions? So, 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 so basically, you uh, switch it off for mm, on the data area, <laughs> yeah. and keep it on, on uh, the wild file. So, uh, well, uh, it, it depends. Uh, mm. I, I, am a, uh, I am in a virtualizer environment. So uh, the, OS part, the OS machine has backed back it up uh, controllers. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is that actually if you have a uh, better backed cache underneath, uh, you cannot rely on the journal anymore because uh, you issue F-Sync and uh, your database thinks that everything is okay, then it returns. Uh, but uh, at, that, in, at the meantime, it can be in cache, actually. I would say that... Um, most likely, if uh, uh, the operator of your host machine uh, is uh, not, not crazy, <laughs> you, uh, you, you can actually safely switch it off. Uh, because um, the idea is, uh, let me explain. Uh, if you have um, an old good RAID controller with that backed cache, it works like this. Um, you have your memory, uh, kernel, shared buffers, anyway, and checkpoint games and f syncs. What going on after it goes through all these layers of Linux IO stack? It at some point, it hits the memory on the controller. This battery pr protected memory. So it's basically it's a flashcard with uh, battery attached, uh, uh, which uh, has enough energy to maintain this data safe for an hour or something like this, uh, up until we uh, take care of the situation. Uh, the this is actually on board of the RAID controller, which uh, figures out what to do to put this data to the disks, how to turn them, or if those are SSDs, what else to do. But the idea is immediately after the data from uh, the memory hits the cache and resides in the cache, uh, if sync returns and Postgres thinks that everything is okay. And what is going on here? Uh, operating system and database effectively doesn't care at all. So if the battery is okay, everything theoretically is okay. The data goes to the disks. 
and you are on the safe side, and in this case, you can switch with journal off. Uh, the problem is that if battery uh, was stolen, uh, not working anymore, and so on, um, most of the proper rate controllers like PERC or like... Uh, Yes, they, they, they actually effectively switch with cache from um, pass-through, uh, like this one, uh, to, um, to actually to wait uh, uh, until, uh, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, so the so basic idea is it doesn't return immediately after it, uh, the data hits the cache. Uh, it only returns that it hits the disk. So basically, you gain on the same uh, safe side. Uh, theor theoretically, there are programs for uh, LSI CLI to, to hack this. I saw people who did that. <laughs> and uh, that can be actually very painful. Uh, but if you actually have the battery, uh, that, that doesn't help to you. So basically, uh, theoretically, you have a journal. And you are writing the journal data. It hits the cache. Then... Uh, bad guy uh, screws things up, but you already have the answer of the thing. So your barrier doesn't save you from uh, losing the data of a journal. So basically, well, it, it's only slowing down the system. It's just slowing down. It's just slowing down, yeah. Thank you. Hey, welcome. Go to services this. <laughs> yeah. And nobody knows what inside AWS. <laughs> so my, my, my suggestion, <laughs> go, go to the pub <laughs> today or tomorrow, <laughs> find someone from AWS and ask this question. <laughs> uh, well, um, they will, they will tell us we well, yeah. Uh, the, the problem with uh, AWS in comparison to running the things on the premises is that you only can believe them and pray. Uh, if you have a good vendor, well, most likely you're on the safe side, but you cannot be sure about this. Uh, mm, most likely, I, I can only guess. It's not the Linux kernel which I can trace and uh, report to you directly what is going on. Uh, I can guess that they use normal SSDs uh, on RDS and, uh, well, they have capacitors and they do not have this problem. But uh, I would not swear. Uh, if I were Amazon, I would do like this. But I'm not Amazon. <laughs> um, also, I'm wondering if you're using a SR system in Intel, um, which blocks off replication. Every time it blocks it, it won't be in any primary. It doesn't have a good position on the replica. And you can have something bad happen when you turn your replica off. So, still. Yeah, and you cannot be aware of that uh, if you don't have any access to the physical level. Maybe, I don't know, they run out of uh, a certain type of disks in the certain data center and they put some old box of old disks and forgot to change them, then they got the new disks and you hit exactly those disks. So no guarantee at all. <laughs> That's completely non-transparent. And uh, actually I cannot say uh, exactly because I don't know how many changes they made in Postgres and Linux and so on. Uh, I pretty much suspect that they did. <laughs> I do not believe they don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I I I even uh, about how Oracle performs internally, I can say more things because uh, you can actually trace, debug that, and so on. About RDS, you can no zero access to trace that. So I only believe they changed. <laughs> 
because how else they can do that. More questions? So if no more questions, thank you all for attending. I will be here all the conference. If you have some questions, find out me and I am at your service then. <laughs> uh, if you want supplementary materials, drop me a message. And thank you again. Thank you. Thanks.